Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, after all these months of our virtual sessions, you probably know that I am Suzanne Stanis, the Director of Heritage Education for Indiana Landmarks. And I'm also a member of the Planning Committee for the Preserving Historic Places Conference. Please continue to watch our conference website for updates on our virtual program that will be September 30th to October 1st. We'll offer one more of these individual virtual sessions on June 24th, and that one is on the rehabilitation of the Wabash, or the Eagles Theater in Wabash. So for those of you that were at the conference in Wabash a few years ago, tune in. I think you're going to be very pleased at uh, the transformation. I want to thank my co-administrators for the conference and these virtual programs, Jessica Kramer from Indiana Landmarks, Jeannie Regan Dinius from the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, and Liz Monroe from Indiana University. And of course, um, the thanks to our generous financial partners, the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, Indiana Landmarks, Indiana University, and the St. Joseph County Commissioners. Our conference sponsors include RC Engineers, City of South Bend, Cornelius O'Brien Lecture Series, Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, Marvin Windows, National Park Service, West Cheney Elsner Associates, and Visit South Bend Mishawaka. Our supporters include Berglund, Cultural Resource Analyst, Historic Preservation and Heritage Consulting, Indiana Archaeology Council, Keyser Consulting, Old National Bank, Ratio Associates, and RE Diamond and Associates. We're using the webinar version of Zoom today, so um, please put any questions you might have in the Q&A. Your microphones and video are muted, um, and we'll work on, uh, we'll work the questions in at the end of Brian's presentation. The session is being recorded and will be available shortly after the presentation. So it's my honor to introduce a former colleague from Indiana Landmarks. And I might just tell you that we have this secret plan to put all the Indiana Landmarks alumni into strategic positions so that we can spread the gospel of historic preservation. I think we're doing pretty good so far. Uh, Brian Blackford, our speaker today, is a project manager for the Indiana Communities Institute at Ball State University. Based in Indianapolis, Brian works with partners across Indiana to enhance the quality of community and build human capacity through special initiatives and educational experiences. These include the annual Indiana Basic Economic Development Course. Through research, policy, and practice, ICI works to connect university resources with regions, cities, towns, and neighborhoods to support modern and comprehensive community economic development and advocate for talent-focused, asset-based approaches to building stronger places, something we're gonna learn a lot more about today. In addition to Indiana Landmarks, Brian also worked for the Indiana State Fair Commission and the Indiana Office of Tourism Development. He served on the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, the Natural Resources Commission, and Indiana Main Street Council. Brian holds a master's in public administration from Ball State and has completed several leadership programs. Welcome to Preserving Historic Places, Brian. Hello, everyone. Good to be here with all of you. Let me uh, share my screen here. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll pull up my PowerPoint. All right. Um, well, again, thanks, Suzanne. That was quite the introduction. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, you know, I think the series of webinars that Indian Landmarks has hosted, which, which I give them um, huge credit for, dates back to July 2020. And to be a part of this series is an honor. Uh, although I do hope in the not so distant future, we can find time to uh, interact again and, and meet offline so we can share stories and, and build those relationships in person. Um, a couple of things today uh, before I get started. I, I do want to say that uh, if you have a pen and paper handy um, where you are, uh, go ahead and pull those out uh, because we will be using them a couple times throughout today's session. Um, I'll ask you to just jot down some notes and think about some things and we'll have some interaction to the extent that we can uh, in this format. So uh, Suzanne gave me a great introduction. I really don't have anything else to add to that. I will say originally I am from a small town 
uh, called Flora, Indiana. Uh, we used to joke that my county uh, had more pigs than people. Um, I loved growing up there, uh, a lot of great memories, and, and I have an interest in and a passion for small towns, um, but also big cities and everywhere in between. Uh, I'm a proud Hoosier uh, and have been honored to have been involved with lots of organizations throughout my history that have been really motivated and, and um, the work we do was to, to promote Indiana, to develop Indiana, to move it forward. Uh, like Suzanne said, I, I started my career right out of college uh, at Indiana Landmarks and had the privilege of working a lot at West Baden at the time, uh, which was an amazing opportunity. This is before it was fully restored. Uh, so I have a lot of fond memories from that and um, have a lot of great connections still from my time at Indiana Landmarks. Uh, she mentioned that uh, my current role is with the Indiana Communities Institute at Ball States. And I won't go into a lot of detail here other than to say our job is to basically connect communities uh, of all sizes to resources at, at Ball States. And we really strive hard to put community front and center in everything we do. You all are the experts of where you live and work. Uh, our job is just to help come in and, and support what you're trying to do uh, through policy practice and research. So today's presentation, uh, I'm going to be going over uh, what we call uh, the comprehensive wealth approach, uh, but I'm going to start by talking about a framework, and this may be a subtle difference, and I'll explain it more later, but uh, a bit more about how this started, which was with the comprehensive rural wealth framework, and how that framework then transitioned into an actual approach for uh, tackling community development in a more holistic way. Uh, we're going to consider also, uh, to relate it back to you all and the work you do uh, in your communities, um, you know, by asking you to do some thought exercises and consider, consider some things along the way that maybe impact what you do every day in the context of the community wealth approach. And certainly uh, looking forward to fielding some questions. Um, I told Susanna and Jessica that, you know, throughout this, if, if there's a pressing issue or question you wanna, you wanna pose in the chat box that they can interrupt me at any time and I'll answer them. Uh, we'll certainly have plenty of time at the end to answer questions as well. So, um, so please, uh, by all means, write those down and, and have those ready to go. So I'm gonna start by setting the stage for you all. And I want you just to think about your favorite community. No other parameters than that. Think about your favorite community. Uh, conjure up an image of what that might look like. It could be somewhere you live now. It could be somewhere that you visit a lot or maybe only once. It could be somewhere you used to live. Just think for a second about that favorite community of yours and picture it in your head. So why did you think of this community? What came to mind? Was it the fact that, that community had a robust GDP or, or maybe you thought about the government expenditures within that community or the tax incentives they offered there? Um, was that what came to mind when you thought about your favorite community? Or did social offerings, the aesthetics of the place, the cultural opportunities, amenities, did that come to mind? My guess is it's the latter. And I want to point out here, if you have not explored the Knight Foundation Soul of the Community study, this is, gosh, a decade old now at this point or close to it. So it's been out a while, but I, I really enjoy it. Um, they study place attachment, what, what connects people with place, what maybe motivates to stay where they are. And sure enough, things like social offerings, aesthetics, openness, ranked very high in their study. So my guess is, like the people surveyed for that research, you too thought of these things when you thought about your favorite community. And yet we often, at least in certain circles, measure how successful a community is, how vital, uh, the vitality of that community uh, based on economic or financial terms. So let's look at a map. This, this is a map of all US counties, so 3,000 or so counties across the country. And it's looking at uh, financial indicators, typical financial indicators or economic indicators, such as wages per capita, average home value, there's a whole slew of, of things that are factored into this. And, and what they've done is they've color coded them based on the strength of those factors. So in this case, based on those factors, green is good. So you might think that there's a population boom happening in Wyoming or upper Minnesota or Nebraska and Iowa. 
and that the South was suffering from population loss and that California uh, was greatly suffering from population loss. Um, the folks were fleeing, you know, the, uh, you know, fleeing the South and the West Coast to go to the upper Midwest based on these factors. But in reality, we know that's not the case uh, because understanding what makes the community good and successful goes far beyond economic or financial indicators. So I'm gonna come back to that point here a little bit later uh, and dig into it a bit more, but I wanna first start with, with a framework, a way to consider communities in ways other than economic and financial terms. I'm gonna introduce you to the uh, wealth, the comprehensive rural wealth framework. And this is something that some of you, I saw the list before I started, and I know some of you are very familiar with this. Uh, it was created by RUPRI, the, the Rural Policy Research Institute, uh, several years ago. And it represents all wealth found in a community, not just financial wealth. And it builds off work done in the 90s, I believe, uh, by Flora and Flora um, called the Community Capital Framework. And that is something I, I know um, if you've done any community work with Purdue Extension, for instance, um, they utilize this a lot. Um, other institutions do. Um, if you've gone through some of the OCRA programming, uh, you've, you've definitely heard about the community capitals. But it's a way to identify assets, um, capitals are. But the framework tries to take it beyond that, at least in theory, and to better understand how they interact with one another, how those capitals uh, maybe relate to one another. So let's go through those capitals. And again, at the bare minimum, this is a good way to asset map in your community and to understand what you have there holistically and comprehensively. So there is financial capital. We'll start there. Again, that's what lots of people automatically think of when they think about community success. Um, and it is a factor, it is important. Um, and that's money or any other liquid assets that can be converted into money, you know, stocks, bonds, credits. There's intellectual capital. And I, and I should say those who are familiar with the community capital framework, uh, it's typically through Flora and Flora understood as seven capitals. Uh, the RUPRI model has eight capitals and uh, intellectual is the one that they add into the fold. Um, intellectual capital is human knowledge, innovation, things that are embedded in a society. Uh, think of copyrights, trademarks, patents, you know, intellectual property, um, but also think of common knowledge. And that's why I have a picture of corn up here. I like to tell the story, my, my colleague, Emily, um, when she, she's from Oregon and when she moved to the Midwest and started working at Ball State, somehow she was talking about tractors and she asked the person she was talking to, well, don't you need a tractor driving license uh, to drive a tractor in Indiana? And this person was like, well, no, not really. I mean, if you grow up in a rural area, you're tr probably driving a tractor at a pretty young age and there's no special license needed. Um, but where she's from in Oregon, it's common knowledge that you do in fact need that license. Um, that is not common knowledge here. So common knowledge can change within a society, community. It could be community specific, uh, et cetera. Human capital, these are the productive capabilities of people, basically. Uh, they're embodied by education, you know, attainment of education, skills and talents. Are you a good woodworker? Do you have an ability to do X, Y, or Z? Uh, but it's also health status in that, you know, your, your ability to actually um, achieve these things and contribute in these ways because you have the health to do it. Social capital, this is trust, relationships, networks. It can be held by individuals, groups, or organizations. Um, if you've ever taken our community development course, uh, we talk a lot about social capital. We talk a lot about social networks, not Facebook and Twitter, but actual social networks within the community and the dynamics of that structure and, and how it can impact conflicts, uh, levels of trust. Um, so this is a hugely important capital. Cultural capital. Uh, these things are embedded in society. They're, they're uh, values and practices. They can be held by, again, by individuals or groups. Uh, and I think it's important here to note that they can be both tangible and intangible. Tangible examples would be works of art, statues, monuments, um, architecture, uh, which I think is important to note for this audience. Um, they can also be intangible. Beliefs, traditions, 
you know, I would venture to say, um, I'm not sure to the extent it is now, but certainly when I grew up in rural Indiana, a Friday night basketball was a big part of our culture. Uh, and, and that's something that we just did. Uh, and, and, and it was embodied in what we were. Political capital, this could be small P or big P political. It's influence, power, or goodwill, again, held by individuals, groups, or organizations. And they can either hold on to that power, they can spend it, they can share it, uh, all to achieve specific goals. So withholding certain elements can be a political activity just as much as uh, exerting influence over something. Physical, uh, this is you know, oftentimes another thing we think about when we think about assets of a community, those physical assets, things that were built, um, equipment, buildings, roads, bridges, but also telecom uh, telecommunications networks, broadband would be a physical capital. Natural capital, these are any resource provided by, by nature, clean air, clean water, land, flora, and fauna would all be examples of, of natural capital. So here's the full list with a short, brief description of them. I just want you to take a couple minutes. This is where your pen and paper come in handy. And I want you to jot down uh, however you see fits. And you can think about your community. You can think about your downtown, if you represent a downtown or a neighborhood or a historic district, whatever you want, that's up to you. But just jot down a couple examples of each capital that you think exists in your community, downtown, whatever it may be, and take a couple minutes to do this. Feel free to drop a few of these in the chat box too, if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, feel free to do that. We'll kind of go through here a little bit one by one and, and um, type some of those in. So feel free to get a head start on that if you want. I'll give you another minute or so to, to wrap up on your own and then we'll go through one by one. All right, feel free to keep working on this if you want, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna move along and, and just kind of ask one by one. Again, at this point, uh, feel free to type in the, in the chat box, I believe. Um, any financial capitals that come to mind uh, for your community or downtown, uh, your neighborhood, whatever uh, context you were looking at it within. 
any thoughts out there on that? Main Street, I see. And I assume that means uh, Main Street in the sense of the commercial activity that probably happens there. Other examples, partners out there who maybe help financially. Yeah, community foundations also. Yep. Local banks, credit unions, absolutely. This one may be a little tougher. What are some thoughts you might have on intellectual capital that exists in your community or your, your downtown? You don't have to name specific names, certainly, but um, any thoughts on intellectual capital? That's a little tougher. Yep. Business startups, for sure. Universities can help in this regard. Not every town is, is uh, has that amenity, but they may be near one. Human capital. You know, how good are your schools in your community? How uh, do you have uh, lifelong learning opportunities through your library? What are some other human uh, human capital opportunities? Institutional memory, yes, absolutely. I think that institutional memory can be a double-edged sword. You certainly want to have a, a basis in the past and understanding of what's been tried or not tried, um, how things might work, who to talk to, uh, but can also sometimes be a hindrance. We've tried that before. A lot of good stuff coming in here. Tight knit group I see on social capital, somebody mentioned, and I think that's something else to be mindful of. That's a very positive thing. Oftentimes when we're in communities and we ask them what they love about their community, they, they say we're, we're a tight knit community, we're, we're close. And I always push back a little bit to say, that's great, you wanna be that, but make sure you're not so tight knit that you're not open to outsiders, for instance, new people moving into town. Um, are they also able to come to the table and get involved? Can they integrate into the social fabric relatively easily or are there barriers to them? And I think that's an honest question you have to ask yourselves when you're in a community, no matter the size of the community. We'll get to this a little bit later. I see a natural capital flooding, flooding river. That, that could be uh, obviously a, um, a negative aspect of that capital. Uh, and we'll get to that a little bit later, the positive and negative aspects of these. Uh, you're all doing a lot of great stuff on social, cultural, go ahead, any, anything else you see there, cultural, political, physical, uh, anything you want to type in. And we'll just do, we'll give another minute or so. A lot of stuff coming in for cultural. That's a pretty uh, easy asset to to relate to and to map. Every community has significant cultural assets that they might have. Same with physical. Natural could ebb and flow, certainly. Some are stronger than others, but everywhere has natural capital. Good. Well, we can stop there. I, I just wanted to go through this and and take the time because asset mapping is, is one of the primary ways that, that people use the rural wealth framework or the community capitals framework. That's historically been the primary use of that. And uh, I think the title of this presentation uh, that was put out there was, you know, uh, something about mining for your resources or, or, you know, what you have in your community. And, and this is part of that exercise to think about it comprehensively uh, and it may go without saying that this may come naturally, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we get stuck on 
what we have or don't have. We don't have the finances to do X, Y, or Z. Okay, well, maybe not, but do you have other capitals that can make up for that, that can help with that? Uh, and I think it's good to think through those things in a more structured way. And obviously some of these are harder than others. Um, thinking of intellectual capitals in your community probably is a little more difficult than thinking of cultural capitals. Uh, that's okay. The point is to, to work through it and to have that discussion. Get back to my PowerPoint here. A couple of things to point out about this, you know, the context of the, of the framework, uh, it is again, a useful asset mapping tool. It can be subjective. Uh, it may, an asset to one person may fit in a certain category and to someone else, it may be entirely different. That's okay. There is no exact science to this. It's more of an art form. Things are not mutually exclusive. Um, an asset could be multiple categories because they're all interconnected. They can also change over time and they can be both generic or very specific. So let me explain that a bit more. Uh, picture of a downtown and you see a building. That building absolutely is a physical capital, represents a physical capital. It was built, it was put there. Uh, and I don't know the specifics of this particular building, but my guess is the architecture has some significance. It's, it uh, was built by a certain architect who maybe had ties to the area. Maybe it's made from materials from the area. Uh, maybe there's elements of it that reflect a certain time period. Uh, so that would be a cultural aspect uh, of that building. Political, maybe less thought about, but that building also represents political capital in that who owns it? Are they local? Are they out of town? Uh, do they maintain it at least a little bit? Do they neglect it? Do they care about it? Are they using it as a tax write-off only? Uh, I think the biggest challenge we all hear sometimes in, in downtowns especially is ownership of buildings and what those owners are willing or not willing to do with those buildings. And, and again, that political capital they're exerting could be because they're renovating it and they're influencing the community in a positive way. It could be they're holding on to that building and they're holding on to that power for whatever reason they may have. And, and that's a challenge for communities. So understanding where that fits in um, in the context of capitals is helpful. How then can you overcome that perhaps by utilizing other capitals? Again, it changes over time. So this railroad in this particular town, um, I don't know if it's active or not, but certainly it was at one point and would have absolutely represented financial capital. It's physical, it's, it's built uh, there. Humans made that and put it there. But what if it was deserted and turned into a rail trail does it become more of a social asset, a place for people to gather and for those networks to be uh, um, you know, built and relationships built? The answer is yes, it absolutely could be. And again, overall, so a downtown has specific elements within it that represent specific capitals, but overall a downtown or a neighborhood could represent uh, capitals, human capitals because of the care and and skills used to help plant flowers or paint buildings or whatever it may be. Um, and the fact that those areas in, in and of themselves are gathering spaces and places to interact with people makes it very much a social capital. So that's kind of an example of how these capitals are interconnected and, and relate to one another within a community or a specific area of a community. And again, don't get hung up when you're asset mapping on exactly where something should go. It could be it could be multiple things. A building again could be categorized in all of these um, as an asset for all of these capitals. So let's then move from this framework, understanding of what the capitals are into an approach to, to execute those capitals in communities. How do you go from that framework, that that structure for considering what you have in your community into asset map into something that's a little more comprehensive and, and something that can help you pursue a community economic development strategy. So enter the comprehensive community wealth approach. This is something that's been established by ICI and the Center for Local and State Policy. Um, and it's, it's adapted from the framework that we just discussed. It ultimately, bottom line, helps shift from traditional economic development so primarily, maybe not entirely, but primarily focused on incentivizing businesses and attracting jobs into a focus more on community economic development based on the premise that 
uh, you have to invest more holistically and deliberately into quality of place and quality of life, which then leads to greater economic success. Again, it uses the community wealth or capitals for asset mapping, but it also takes it a step further and uses them for decision making and resource allocation, which we'll get to here in a little bit. There are some foundational principles to this approach. Starting with quality of life and quality of place, they both are, are in and of themselves economic development. Um, it's important to develop for your community that exists currently, the people who live there now. Again, harkening back to what we just talked about, community wealth and capitals, they are interconnected. And decisions and policies related to those capitals um, have both an impact that's short-term and long-term, positive and negative. Let's dissect that one by one. So community uh, quality of life and place are economic developments. Uh, people no longer follow jobs specifically, at least in general. Rather, they look for high quality communities near job opportunities. They prioritize good schools, amenities, uh, a sense of place, openness, social offerings, the things we talked about earlier, the things you thought about when you, when you thought of your favorite community. And I know I'm preaching the choir on this stuff. I know a lot of you have been talking about the importance of quality of place uh, and quality of life for, for decades. Uh, I remember when I first started Indian Landmarks in 2002, it was a priority for them then. Um, so nothing new here, but increasingly the message is getting out and increasingly the research backs this up. So let me point out one particular study that is relatively new that helps make this case. So if you're in communities, maybe you have some skeptics to this uh, who are maybe still a little too focused on traditional economic development. Not that that shouldn't play a role, it should. We're only saying that it shouldn't be the primary role uh, and that there should be other things that you should be looking at to make your community better. So if you need some, um, some oomph behind that argument, this study will help you do that. Um, my colleague, Dr. Warnell and some other others that she knows um, studied micropolitan communities across the country. They, they picked some and then they categorized those communities into two, two different groups based on several variables. So they determined by looking at the data that some of those micropolitan areas uh, really did have a lot of investments in quality of life. They focused on building a high quality of life. Other of those communities focus more predominantly on building a high quality of business environment. And so they categorized those two based on the data. And then they looked, among other things, and I'm only going to talk about this one thing, but they measured population growth and job growth in those two different cohorts to see how that panned out. So basically, you know, when looking at population growth and job growth, how do communities with high quality of life compare with communities with high quality of business environment. So this is population change. The graph on the uh, screen left, you notice is about those communities that focus primarily on quality of life. The one on the right is, is measuring population change and those communities focus mainly on quality of business environment. And you can see uh, in the regression model, uh, the arrow helps, but you can see it there with the dots too that the population is growing, in fact, in communities with a higher quality of life focus, whereas it's relatively flat in, in communities that are more focused on building a higher quality business environment. Okay, you might say that stands to reason that, you know, that, that feels right, I understand that. What about job growth? Uh, you know, because if someone's really focused, a community's really focused on building a high quality business environment, you would think that would translate more directly into job growth. In fact, it does not. Uh, again, screen left is uh, measuring job growth in those communities with a high quality of life. And then right is measuring job growth in those communities with a greater focus on quality of business environment. And you can see again, on the left, there is growth in those communities in terms of jobs, whereas on the right, there is, it's pretty stagnant. So per the research, quality of life and place factors are a basis for economic development. Uh, having a community where people wanna live not only attracts more people, it then leads to job growth. And pursuing and prioritizing those traditional economic development strategies, um, you know, maybe doesn't get where you want it, where, doesn't get your community where you want it to go as much as um, pursuing a quality of life strategy. 
So in point number two, it's important to develop your community for the people who live in your community. Uh, I think that's especially important to note now because as the tide is turning and as things like talent attraction become more trendy, that's great. We should invest in those mechanisms, but not at the cost of people who live there currently. Because if you're focused on people who live in your community now and what they want to improve their community, it's gonna improve quality of place and by extension, attract more people. Um, and even if it doesn't attract more people, the good news is you're gonna make a great place for people who live there and that's a win-win. Um, I do think it's important to note that, you know, community development is a lot of things to different things to different people. So you have to talk to folks uh, to really do it well and that's not easy. Uh, again, our community development course spends a ton of time talking about community engagement. And it's so important to, to develop well for the community members who live there and to ultimately then build a place that others want to move to and live in. Uh, you have to communicate, you have to involve, and it can't just be um, what some communities I've worked in call the SOS or same all six can't be those people at the table. In fact, you can't always just have a table out. Maybe you throw the table aside and find other creative ways to, to engage community members to understand what they truly want in their communities. So number three, uh, community wells are interconnected. We've already explored this a little bit, but let's take another example. Uh, let's look at Oregon. Oregon has a lot of natural capital forests and rivers and lakes, it has ocean front, it has deserts, it has mountains. Um, but let's look specifically at forests. Natural assets like forests uh, connect with and, and relate to other capitals, including financial, human, political, social, just to name a few. And, and here's how. So social capital, uh, again, my friend Emily um, used to live in Oregon and a lot of her friendships and relationships were often centered around hikes in the woods, camping trips. So it was a place to gather, a place to connect, a place to build social capital. It's political capital. Trade certainly can be political. Yes, it's financial, um, but, but trade can be very political. And so that represents the forest via lumber, represent political capital. Also via that lumber, they represent uh, financial capital jobs in the logging industry, jobs in the, uh, you know, the lumber industry, human capital, one of the craftspeople who are able to turn wood into wonderful pieces of arts and furniture and other things. Uh, so that's the human talent there involved with that. So again, all these capitals are interconnected greatly. And not only are the wealth and capitals interconnected, but so are the policy decisions that relate to those capitals. So for instance, again with Oregon, policies to uh, manage forests and how best to do that impact more than natural capital. Yes, over logging um, can be a detriment to obviously the natural capital, most definitely, but it can also have a de be a detriment on, on the finances of the local community. The political, human, cultural capitals are all impacted by over logging. On the flip side, stopping logging altogether has impacts. Uh, research shows that actually uh, former logging towns that have been completely, um, you know, that no longer have logging in, in them, uh, there's an increase in poverty rates, a decrease in educational attainments. Um, that's not to say that you should or shouldn't log, it's to say there's trade-offs. And if you are going, if you're in Oregon and your community decides it doesn't want logging anymore, okay, that's the decision the community makes, but you have to account for uh, things like increased poverty rates um, that impact human capital or, or financial capital. Uh, same with educational attainment. Uh, you just have to be mindful of these things and, and account for them. Which leads to this idea number four, and that is capitals and assets and how you work with them and what you have and, and the policies you implement to take advantage of them or, or not, um, have short and long-term impacts that can be both positive and negative. So again, if you understand in Oregon that making a decision about logging or not impacts well beyond national capital, 
you can prepare for those consequences better if you understand them. And so I think that's really why it's important to consider both the short and long-term impacts and the positive and negative impacts because it can help you prioritize your options. It can help you plan for consequences, uh, mitigate bad outcomes that may arise or maximize good outcomes. So let's look at an example um, that we all might be a little bit familiar with depending on where you live and that's school consolidation. So here's a small example. I didn't even write down every capital and this is a quick, you know, quick brainstorm of this, but a, a decision to consolidate schools impacts certainly financial capital, social capital, human capital, and political capital. And those are all interconnected, um, not only back up to school consolidation, but amongst each other in the short and the long term. So short term is above the line, long term is below the line. Uh, green, generally a positive, red, generally a negative, and it can change over time. A short-term impact of school consolidation could be financial in, in, a, in a negative way because uh, it costs money to close down schools and, and get rid of buildings or find other uses for them. So there could be some increased costs. Uh, in the long run though, at least in theory, there would be savings from um, admin side of things, from building maintenance side of things. And so that would be in the long-term a positive. So just understanding the short and long, positive, negative, what's that balance? And what do you have to do in the short term to get to the point where you can reap the benefits in the long term. Another example I'll point out because this gets a little complicated is, is human capital. And you'll notice here that I have one of the impacts in the long term. You know, in theory, if you consolidate schools, uh, you're likely going to consolidate resources and, and, and achieve a higher quality school in the long run. There'll be more opportunities for kids to maybe get different languages, take different AP classes uh, because they're able to consolidate those resources and, and, and do those things. Um, and so then that leads to developing kids in a way that makes them um, their educational attainment higher. And so let's look at a maybe long-term impact of that. And that is that better educated kids will leave and not return to your community. A big issue in rural communities, although I would argue that's over time throughout history, there's always kids who leave, right? The question is, are any of them returning? And this is where this gets a little crazy and complicated because you say, well, how is having a better educated student a negative? And it's not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is in the long term for the community, those better educated kids who leave and maybe don't come back do have potentially negative impact on your community. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't consolidate schools for that reason. It just means you have to think about that in the long term. And one example here is that a, a mayor, um, Mayor Ryan Daniel told me this, he's from Columbia City. And he um, implemented a program there where when high school seniors graduate from their community schools, they send them a little miniature mailbox with a note inside that says, you know, congratulations, great job. We hope you go out, go to college, go to trade school, go wherever you go, military, see the world, do what you do. But when you're ready to settle down and have a family, don't forget we're here. And here's why we're special in that regard. You know, we'll see long-term success with that, but that's a chance to understand the trade-offs, understand the impacts, and try to mitigate those up front. So we'll take a quick minute because we're running uh, a little short on time, but um, just think about um, a project you've done in your community uh, or that you want to do in your community and think through a couple short and long-term positive and negative impacts um, that may result from that project. Take just a couple minutes to do that.
so the time we have probably best just to think you know about one particular capital and um in the context of that decision or, or opportunity and and what those positive and negatives might be we're not going to review these necessarily i just wanted you to think through them so you can keep working on that um, on your own certainly i do see some great questions are coming in so i want to get back to those and save some time for more so let me move on here So a lot of you are in the world of preservation and, and saving your downtowns and, and making them more uh, vibrant. So let me just look at that, you know, that school consolidation example and turn it into something that maybe relates to you more directly. And that is historic tax credits. Um, you can certainly go through there and see some of the short and long-term impacts, positive and negative. Uh, in the short term, financially, it may be less revenue for general use elsewhere, but in the long term, in theory, you've done well. It brings in more investments and adds to the tax base through that additional investment. Socially, it helps lead to uh, more activity because you're renovating a downtown area like we talked about earlier. Uh, of course, you have to be careful. Um, if gentrification becomes displacement in that renovated area, that's, that's not a positive outcome. And how do you work to mitigate that? Physically, you're saving structures, culturally, you're saving history. So there's a mix there. Um, and the point of this exercise is never to dictate yes or no on a, on a decision. The point is to understand um, what those options are, what those challenges are, what the trade-offs might be, and then working towards advancing them and mitigating them in the future. So again, uh, this can be used as a asset mapping tool. It can be used to prioritize projects and to consider impacts. And it can be ultimately, which we're not really getting into today, used to, to allocate resources. You know, if you know you have um, this project that's coming down, you know, you, you decide on this project together as a community, uh, you can then identify, okay, what are your financial assets out there to, to help us get that done? What are our social assets? You know, that's where you can start to name names and organizations to get those things done. So when we're in communities and doing this work, and we incorporate the wealth approach into our community development course a little bit um, in some of our um, action planning processes that we have, uh, we certainly use it for asset mapping. We also use it for um, impact considerations like we just did. A couple closing thoughts here and then we'll get some questions. Uh, it's hard. Uh, this is not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, it relies on a new paradigm that not everyone has bought into. This idea that you have to build better places is still a novel one in some areas, unfortunately. Uh, using the wealth approach won't provide all the answers. It requires honest and thoughtful discussion. Um, but it's worth it because it supports community first development. It ensures transparency and it helps prepare for obstacles and opportunities moving forward. This is my contact information. Um, so reach out to me anytime if you want. Uh, I am seeing some, some questions on chat and I think now's a good chance to take more questions. Um, I can start to address some of these, Suzanne, or do you wanna jump in there and say something? Well, I will say uh, that's a very valid point that was raised about the term mining and uh, that uh, was an attempt to be clever with the title and not, uh, not something that came from Brian or the Indiana Communities Institute. So apologies for that. And uh, definitely there are better ways to, uh, to describe this. But one of the comments that came through I thought was interesting about the idea of asset mapping, assuming that the population is, is very similar and everybody's kind of agreeing on what um, these different capitals are. So how do you deal with this when you've got a community that has a very diverse um, ethnic, racial, income level, uh, you know, how, how do you deal with those different, uh, different groups? So I, I'm reading the question now, and, and uh, I, I would say you're not wrong at all. Um, that, that word asset mapping could be loaded in many ways because one person's asset might be somebody else's barrier. And I think the key with that is a couple of things. One is, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's no science to this. It's a, it's a discussion starter. And hopefully if you're having these discussions with a group that's diverse and inclusive, then you can better understand those different perspectives. And the point is not to necessarily agree on what's an asset or what isn't. The point is to put it on the table and to understand those different perspectives and to then see, okay, um, we always thought having this over here was a great asset. We're now understanding these people, you know, have a different opinion of that. 
and and that's okay. Um, how can we help change and make sure that asset is not a barrier to those folks? Um, so you're right. This this is subjective. It can be different for different people, and that's the point of having conversations, and that's the point of having more than the same old six at the table. I can't stress how important that is. We do other sessions on, you know, we call it going beyond meetings. How do you how do you interact with people and get their feedback in ways beyond the six o'clock town hall meeting? Because let's be honest, a lot of people can't make that, especially underserved people can't make that. So you have to be inclusive. And the comment that just came through about actually meeting different audiences where they are rather than saying, you know, please come to us to go out into the community. Yeah, and there's a lot of tools and fun ways to do that. Um, I think placemaking helps with this. Oftentimes people think placemaking is the end result, and it is, but I think it can be used as a creative way to, to engage people and understand their concerns and, and get their feedback. Uh, so absolutely, you have to do creative things to talk to people. And is Emily Warnell's study available online? Uh, I, you know what? I don't know. I should know that. Okay. Um, I will find out and I can send that to you. Yeah, if it is, um, please send a link to it. And then we send a link. We'll send that link out to everybody that participated. And I know I know they had some early results and I'm not sure where that stands in the peer review process. Um, so I will find out. Okay. And um, one of the questions, I'm not entirely sure I understand this, and I'm sorry, uh, this is the problem with the webinar, we may need a little clarification, but um, they ask, in your educational example, can you give an example using a non-consolidation, um, like maybe a school closing model? Is that, is that something that you could talk about? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand, but okay, yeah, I mean, yeah. that could be that it's just a matter of uh, maybe school districts aren't consolidating, but maybe an elementary school in a school district is closing. I mean, I'm facing that now where I live. Uh, and just understanding that that has a huge impact on a lot of capitals. You know, schools in particular are a gathering place for people. Uh, social capital related to schools is, is tremendous. Uh, and so it's not just a matter of, oh, we're going to move the kids over, everything will be fine. It's a matter of that maybe where people get together to have cook-offs and, and go to basketball games. And, and so understanding that dynamic is important. And is, uh, you talked about the program that you do on going beyond meetings. How can people attend that? Is it a webinar or a handout? So we are doing a webinar on it through our ICI Academy. We do a series of webinars. Uh, it is, I think, June 22nd. Unfortunately, we are sold out on that. So we may offer another one. Uh, the best way is to get on our e-blast to find out about our opportunities or go to our website at IC, uh, bsu.edu backslash ICI or email me and I can get you on our list. Uh, but we do offer occasional uh, webinars on, on that topic. Uh, we incorporate a lot into our community development course, which we will be offering to the public in November in Bloomington. Uh, and that's all available through the ICI website. You can look and see. Great. Yeah, we just posted it in the chat, uh, but we'll, again, we'll have that in the follow-up. We will be sending this uh, link out to this recording. So um, if you've got other questions, go ahead, please, and, and put them in the Q&A box. Um, or anything else, Brian, that you'd like to promote? Or, oh, you did mention that your economic development um, Institute that you have, there are scholarships available for that? So yeah, so we, uh, again, through our ICI Academy, we have a series of free webinars uh, that are hour long, like, like today's webinar. Uh, we have uh, online courses that do cost, there are fees to some of those. We have in-person courses, knock on wood. We're planning to be back in person for the first time in over a year for our annual economic development course, which is what you referenced, Suzanne. That is in August. We delayed it this year to get, hopefully get past uh, enough people vaccinated to be able to do that. Uh, and that'll be in Muncie. It's, it's, we've been doing it for like 35 years. There are scholarships available through utility companies in particular. Uh, so look that up. That's the basic Indiana Economic Development course that's on our website. The community development course we uh, will be doing in November. We have not aligned um, scholarships for that yet, but we likely will. So stay tuned for that as well. Okay, and uh, another question, what role does tourism, which is uh, typically externally focused, what does that play, role does that play in economic development? 
Well, I love this question because I'm a former, I spent seven years at the state tourism office. And I would say a couple of things. One is you are often in a community first as a visitor. And so you get a feel for it in that experience and, and, and start to understand it. You can't certainly know it fully, but first impressions of it, which matter, um, certainly is part of the tourism element. And also if a visitor likes it, your locals are probably gonna like it for the most part. I mean, people travel to go to breweries, they travel to go to certain restaurants. Those amenities are, are there to serve as visitors oftentimes, but they also create that quality of life and place that local residents want. So they're not mutually exclusive at all um, because you wanna, you, know, you want a place that has those amenities. If you wanna live in a place like that, you wanna visit a place like that, so they're connected. Well, I want to thank everybody. Oh, and I, I think I've decided I'm going to retire to Oregon and become a tractor driver's ed teacher. <laughs> yeah, I hear it's a big out there. <laughs> well, yeah, and uh, even in Indiana, children of the suburbs learn how to drive tractors. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's great. Well, thank you so much. As I said, we're gonna we'll, we will send you uh, probably early next week a link to this recording as well as some of the uh, things that Brian mentioned. And uh, we'll get that Emily Warnell study if you're able to find that. Um, but thank you so much for all this very helpful information. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. And again, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. And uh, don't forget to check our schedule and uh, join Preserving Historic Places or our next virtual session that will be on June 24th. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>